All right, students will get started. Okay. Yeah. So a good morning to all of you who are here and a good morning to all of you who are online. And um, we'll start off today with First Kings. Uh, we looked at First Samuel and Second Samuel, which was mainly about uh, Samuel the prophet and also about Saul and David. And now we are coming into First Kings, which is mainly about King Solomon and about all the events that occur after the kingdom gets divided. Uh, so, and of course, there's a, we have some important kings. We have many important kings. Um, Ahab is one of them in the northern kingdom. We have Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom. So these are some of the main things that are covered in first kings. So let's get going. Uh, the genre will obviously be mainly narrative history because we have a historical record of all the things that took place. Also, there would be many prophecies mentioned because the Lord would probably be prophesying against people or he would be prophesying in favor of people. So uh, the main genre that we find in First Kings would be narrative history and also prophecy. Now, who is the writer of First Kings and Second Kings? Um, there's not much clarity regarding that. Some scholars say that most probably Jeremiah is the one who would have compiled um, you know, all the historical records. Different people would have written down um, records of events which are taking place. And then finally, he would have brought it all together and compiled it into a um, single book. Because if when you look in the Hebrew Bible, they don't have first kings and second kings. They just have the book of kings. It's only in the English Bible and then in later translations that people began to divide it in, into two halves. But otherwise, you just have basically one book of kings. And so Jeremiah probably did the compilation, except, of course, for the last portion in second kings, which talks about something which happened after he was dead. So uh, except for the last portion, most probably Jeremiah would have compiled um, the rest of these two books. Um, and um, it is generally said that you know, he would have made use of a lot of historical records, which other people had been writing down from time to time, because these things are mentioned in First Kings. First Kings 1141 talks about a historical book. Can someone tell me what uh, First Kings 1141 talks about? Which historical book does it talk about? Any historical books at all mentioned in um, First Kings chapter 1141? No, then in that case, it must be so sorry. Second Kings 1141. Second Kings 1141. So it must be First Kings then, unless I really got the whole thing wrong. Exactly. That was a historical record which was maintained at that time. It's not mentioned here in our Bible, but that was a historical record which someone was maintaining. So another one that is mentioned in 1419 is the book of the history of the kings of Israel. That was another record which someone had written down. So based on all of these records, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jeremiah or whoever else did the compilation would have chosen the portions which the Holy Spirit is urging them to choose. And only those portions would have finally been mentioned in our first Kings and second Kings. So there were a lot of historical records which were maintained at that time. And the Lord would have decided which portion should enter into the Holy Scripture. So the person who did the final editing, the final compilation, he would have chosen those portions which the Holy Spirit is urging him to include. And only those things would have finally been included in our um, Bible. OK, so um, they say that maybe this compilation was done by Jeremiah. Moving on to the key personalities in First Kings. Of course, you have David and his son Solomon. Then you have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and then you have Elijah the prophet. Ahab, of course, is mentioned. Uh, this Jezebel. These are some of the main characters whom we see in the in First Kings. Uh, why was First Kings written? 
of course it's providing a historical record of israel uh, the kings which they had it also gives a more spiritual angle to the whole record in the sense um it's pointed out whether each king followed the lord or not you know it generally starts off with that description whether this was a man who was following god or whether he was a man who was disobeying the lord so um we see a very clear description of whether they were under submission to yahweh or not and generally we notice that those who were following yahweh always had more blessings uh, did better in their you know, during their reign and the ones who were not really committed to the lord um, their political fortunes were not that good so we see this uh, in these records uh, we also have one important we have two important prayers a lot of important prayers in fact in first kings uh, but one of the main ones is the solomon solomonic prayer the prayer which solomon makes when the temple is dedicated that would be chapter 8 okay so um, that's one of the important prayers uh, which are included in this particular book uh, structure coming to the structure of first kings chapters 1 to 11 is where we have um, solomon coming to the throne how did he come to the throne what is what are the politics involved what conspiracies happened all of that is mentioned and then of course how how he builds the temple all the other things that he builds all those things are mentioned also chapters 1 to 11 also talk about how he backslid and how he married a lot of uh, foreign women you know for the sake of the political contacts that he can get and he finally dies um not in an honorable way but after you know having gone away from the lord so we see all of those things in chapters 1 to 11 the second portion of the book chapters 12 to 22 will be mainly a record of what happened after the kingdom got split up into two portions so that is the main content of the second portion and um, we have elijah being mentioned very prominently in the second part because he's the one who deals with ahab and warns him not to you know uh, go on with his idol idol worship and all of that so those are the things we see now um when we talk about israelite history a lot of bible students are rather very confused about the whole thing but then there are some very basic things i think which every person who claims to be a christian should know about israelite history um mainly because uh you know it's basically from that lineage that the messiah came and uh, those stories the specific stories were put there in the old testament for us to learn from uh, for us to receive correction from so um you know you have all these people rehoboam and um, jeroboam and ishbosheth and mephibosheth and uh, most christians have absolutely no clue who on earth they are you mentioned david solomon they'll put up their hand and say yes we know these people but you go a little beyond that and they have no clue and sometimes the situation gets rather bad they they're not even aware that the kingdom got split into two and there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom uh, now that's rather bad uh, it's all right maybe if you're just a lay believer but here you all are students okay students of the bible and so we would need to know some of these basic things okay so we will try to cover some of the main major things uh, you know which we would need to know as bible students of course it would not be possible to get into all of the stories uh, but at least the very main things for instance everyone knows that solomon became king but not um, many are very aware of the conspiracy which took place how it was difficult for him to come to the throne and what and all they had to do to finally put him on the throne um, and uh, you know all the backstabbing and all the scheming which happened in the background not many seem to be even aware of that they just assume that one fine day david says my son why didn't you go sit on the throne and he goes and sits on the throne and that's the end of the story no no but that's not how it takes place so in fact if you look right in the first chapter of first kings um is where you have the older brother of course i uh, think david had many sons but one of the most prominent among them was adonijah 
So Adonija had this deep desire to be on the throne because after all, he was one of the elder brothers. Um, Solomon, on the other hand, was not very important. He was somewhere down the line. So Adonija always aspired to be on the throne. And so he, uh, when his father is too old and no longer is able to move around and inspect what's going on, uh, and you know, like now he's almost uh, sort of bedridden. He's in his room always. He's too weak to do anything. And so Adonija thinks now is the right time for me to put myself on the throne. And so he literally, you know, establishes himself on the throne, taking the support of some people. David, uh, David's commander Joab is one of the people who supports Adonija. The other person who gives support is Abiathar. You know, Joab and Abiathar are two people who had been with David almost his entire life uh, through all of his struggles. And uh, I'm not sure why they did not want to remain faithful to Solomon, but they decided to take sides with Adonija. And so they hatched this conspiracy to put um, Adonija on the throne. Uh, but Zadok, the priest, Nathan, the prophet, David's uh, special command, you know, the, so the soldiers who were like a special unit who did uh, great battles, you know, he even they even killed some giants and all of that. Uh, they, they remain faithful. So they don't participate in this conspiracy. But many of the other important figures, they participate in this conspiracy and they put Adonija on the throne. And uh, Adonija, who was greedy for the throne, what do you think he would have done next? One of the first steps that he would have taken is to somehow get rid of Solomon because if, as long as Solomon is alive, he will be a threat. And so then it is Nathan who comes along and you know he warns Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, that their lives are in danger. She says, you better go and inform the king about what has happened you know, because they didn't have news channels, they didn't have phones, mobiles. So it, it would have, uh, David would not even be aware that something like this is happening because he's confined to his room. He can no longer walk around and all of that. So Bathsheba goes over there and tells the king about what is happening. And then David is very angry and he says, no, no, Solomon has to be on the throne because God is the one who ordained that. God decided that Solomon would be the successor. And so it must be Solomon who should be placed. And so he calls his faithful priest Zadok and uh, so a small party of you know supporters of David they take Solomon to a place named Gihon and over there they formally anoint him as the king and uh, the people of Gihon have a big celebration and it says in chapter 1 um, in verses 39 and 40 it talks about how there was a great celebration and it says in verse 40 all the people went up after him, playing pipes and rejoicing greatly so that the ground shook with the sound. So while this entire celebration is going on to celebrate the new kingship of Solomon, the other king who has established himself, Adonija, he hears all this noise coming and he thinks, what is this great celebration that's going on? And because he's having a party of his own, you know, his coronation party. And so uh, he has invited all these guests and they are having their celebration. And then they hear this loud noise coming from Gaihon. And they are wondering what is going on. And then Abiathar, the priest, his son, comes running over there. And he says, you know what? David has gone, has to overcome a conspiracy and then be established as king. And we talked about Adonijah's reaction when he realizes that uh, he has been found out, his conspiracy has been found out. He goes and takes hold of the horns of the altar and asks for mercy to be spared. And Solomon promises and says that he will spare his life, that he will not kill him. And so Solomon responds to the situation in a godly manner. He could have very legally, rightfully killed and executed Adonija right then and there, but he does not do that. He just simply says in verse 52, if he shows himself to be worthy, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground. But if evil is found in him, he will die. Okay, so he gives him a second chance. And how does Adonija respond when he gets a second chance? He comes up with a new scheme on how he can take the throne. 
because now he goes to Bathsheba and he says, you know, I've lost the kingdom. I was the elder brother. I should have been on the throne. But now it's been given to someone else. But maybe there's one act of kindness which you can do to me. And uh, so he says, you know, request permission so that um, Abishag, the Shunammite, who was a concubine of David, whether she can be given in marriage to me. And it's almost like as if he's indirectly saying, you know, I am going to be marrying a concubine of David. So now I have a say to the throne. I have a right to the throne. So he is declaring himself as a contender for the throne. So this indirect tactic he adopts in the hope of still being able to snatch back the throne. And so when Bathsheba goes very innocently to um, uh, Solomon and makes this request, you know, Solomon says, what a foolish request because if you if you know if i were to give um, abishag in uh, allow or give permission for abishag abishag to be married to adonija it would be almost like giving my entire throne to him and so he says um, adonija does not deserve to be spared anymore uh, and so uh, he you know so he is punished and uh, joab who has participated in the conspiracy he is the one who goes running now and he takes hold of the horns of the altar. That we see in chapter 2, uh, verse 29. So Joab, who participated in the conspiracy this time with Adonijah, he runs to the altar and takes hold of the horns of the altar. But because he refuses to leave the altar and come outside, um, yeah, one thing that we need to know about Joab is that he doesn't just go into the courtyard and take hold of the horns of the altar in the courtyard. He actually goes inside the tent. Inside At that time, they still had the tent, right? Because uh, the temple had not yet been built. So he actually enters into the holy place and he takes hold of the horns of the altar over there. Um, and uh, so Solomon says, you know, he's been uh, given many chances and so he must be killed. And so Joab is killed for his treason. So just for us on a side note, the temple or the tabernacle, which was there in those days, it had five altars. Okay, so the first altar was is the one in the courtyard, you know, um, where you have most of the sacrifices being performed. Um, and uh, then you also have that large bronze vessel which they used for washing their hands and for ritual cleansing and all of that you also had um, two altars in the holy of holies and um, there is one at the entrance of the uh, yeah there are two in two in the holy place so sorry there are two in the holy place and one at the entry to the uh, holy of holies so totally there are five altars and Joab actually runs into the holy place and takes hold of the altar over there. And he refuses to come out. And so uh, finally, uh, I think it's Benaya who goes inside and kills him right then and there at the altar because of uh, all his unfaithfulness, even towards David as well. You know, the man was not exactly very um, good in his value system. So, uh, we, uh, so we, this is the conspiracy which takes place. And finally, because the Lord's hand is upon Solomon, he is able to come to the throne. This is one basic thing that you would need to know as a Bible student. Okay. Um, another thing is about Solomon himself, the promises that God makes to him, and how does he uh, respond to the blessings of God. So we see that uh, in chapter 3. Uh, just a minute, please. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just worried that I don't know, should not miss out on the online students. Okay. Um, yeah. In uh, Solomon starts off his rule in a very godly manner uh, with much devotion and dedication because we see in chapter three that he goes to Gibeon and how many burnt offerings does he make on the altar over there? First Kings chapter three. I need to do this from time to time just to keep my students awake um, so that you know they do not go into another realm. First Kings chapter 3, verse 4. How many sacrifices does Solomon make on the altar in honor of God? 
a thousand burnt offerings that's a lot of cattle that is his devotion he realizes that he is not really cut out for this amazing role that has been given to him he is humbled by the honor which god has placed upon him in gratitude he goes over there and he sacrifices a thousand burnt offerings you know admitting to god that he does not deserve all of this but because god has been merciful he is willing to take on the responsibility and god who is really pleased with him comes to him in a dream and god says to him ask for whatever you want me to give you and solomon does not ask for material things or temporary things you know he makes a very beautiful request in verse 7 it says i am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties over here he's not saying that he's actually a little kid because obviously he was not a little child he meant a little child in the sense he doesn't have the wisdom needed to look after a people uh, to look after the people of god and so he says that he needs god's wisdom to be able to look after them and he says in fact in verse 9 he says who is able to govern this great people of yours he doesn't say my people he says lord your people so he starts off his rule with the realization that these are god's people that he is going to be ruling he is going to be a leader of god's people and so he needs to be extra careful how he treats them how he looks after them so he is so aware of his responsibilities and so in verse 12 the lord says i will do what you have asked for i will give you a wise and discerning heart and he says because you have not asked for you know the material things which people generally ask for i will also give you that so the lord says in verse 13 both wealth and honor you know would would also be given to him so um yeah the discussion going on in the last row no you can have the discussion later okay so um yeah okay so this is basically how um, um he starts off his rule and then what happens you know when we come to rehoboam his son what is the one request which the people make of rehoboam the son they say your father imposed such heavy taxes on us that we could not bear the burden will you be kind enough and lighten the load for us So what happened to this man, this Solomon, who said, "Lord, they are your people. I am like a little child, and I do not know how to look after them." Something happened to him along the way. All of that power and position and wealth and all the praises of the nations—it kind of got to his head, and he forgot his primary purpose. He forgot why he was sitting on that throne. and you know if you're all sitting over here thinking what on earth does it have to do with me today don't we see that happening in our church today you know people who are like really big mega preachers and mega pastors they forget why they have been placed in that position it is to lead your people oh lord not their people it is to lead god's people so they have a commitment to the uh, lord and solomon over here forgot his responsibility yes Hmm. Yeah, so uh just an example that someone was giving uh about something that they observed in ministry uh that's not very admirable um so yeah so he spent 7 years building the temple of the lord and then he spends the next 13 years building a grand palace for himself and he builds a grand palace for this uh egyptian pharaoh's daughter whom he has married so that he can have you know political relations with them and you know improve his status and position and he then he goes on to marry a whole bunch of other ladies all from you know um international circles so that he can establish political contacts with all of them and improve his international trade and uh, so somewhere along the way for him power position wealth uh all of these things become very very important and so for uh, so 
to to have the funds needed to for all of that he began to impose very heavy taxes and in fact even in jerusalem and you know um, uh, historical records they say that he built all these really fancy gardens in jerusalem so that it would look like a very grand capital and uh, so they didn't have you know good irrigation systems in those days so he literally had to build canals and all of that to bring water you know into the different parts of jerusalem to uh, to tend to all of those orchards and gardens and all of that so huge amounts of money was needed and uh, so he began to tax the people very heavily the people who belonged to the lord the people on you know whom he was supposed to be looking after he began to exploit them for his own interests to lift himself up okay and um, also another thing which i you know i just noticed when i was doing my uh, reading of this uh, book he purchases a lot of arabian horses you know very very expensive arabian horses i mean they, they are the best uh, breed at least i mean at that time they were considered the very best breed for what i mean is he going to be fighting any wars what did the lord promise him he said he's going to enjoy a time of peace so that in that time of peace it can be a time when all the people can grow in god and enjoy the security which they have all the other nations are busy trying to defend themselves but these people are safe secure and you know instead of enjoying that security and making use of the peace that god has given this man on the other hand begins to exploit the people and he buys all these arabian horses knowing that he's not going to be needing for any battle simply as a status symbol merely as a status symbol all those horses would just be sitting over there as display that's all so it's a very sad thing that he does yes so probably it started off with uh, material greed and once that level of backsliding set in it you know once you allow the first stage of backsliding to set in and you don't correct yourself when god is you know convicting you in your heart then you start going into deeper levels of backsliding which is what we see over here in solomon's case because gradually maybe to please his wives and his international contacts he also begins to participate in their idolatrous practices you know because now for him international relations has become very very important now uh, he is securing his power and his kingdom through international relations rather than by having a relationship with the lord and strengthening that okay so uh, these are all things that we can actually learn from so we are doing all of this in detail uh, because we are all going to be in leadership positions tomorrow so it's not so important for you to you know be nice to people and uh, try to build your relations with them just to butter them no it would be better for you to build your relationships with the lord strengthen that because that will establish whatever work you want to do for him that will take you forward you don't need to have a partnership and approval with all the people around you though of course you're meant to live in a godly manner at peace with them in a way which uh, they cannot point fingers regarding so that's also good but i'm just saying don't butter people uh, don't reach out to people because you think that they you know your ministry depends on them and their support it's never like that Okay, so these are all vital truths that we can gain for our own leadership and for our own ministry in the future. All right. Um, yeah. Um, so, because um, Solomon has fallen so badly, uh, not just in the in the matter of greed, but even in the matter of spiritual adultery, because he's now going into idol worship. He's participating in things which. Uh, which disgust the lord so because of that god finally decides that uh, you know the 12 tribes should no longer remain under uh, you know the davidic lineage and so in chapter 11 you see uh, god choosing someone else and that is basically how jeroboam comes into the picture so we have ahijah the prophet of shilo 
who comes wearing a new robe in chapter 11 and in front of Jeroboam he cuts the new robe into uh, 12 portions and he says take 10 portions because you're going to have 10 tribes under you okay so Jeroboam had just been newly appointed by Solomon as one of the leaders of his labor forces okay because he had all these building projects running so he would have many labor forces so um, Jeroboam was placed in charge of one of those and now Ahijah the prophet comes to Jeroboam and says you know what you're no longer just going to be the head of a labor force you are going to be a future king and so he promises um, he, he says that the Lord is, is going to be giving you 10 tribes and this uh, very lovely promises that are made to Jeroboam in verse 37 of chapter 11 it says you will rule over all that your heart desires God is in no way treating him as second best. God says to Jeroboam, everything that you desire will be granted to you. In no way will you be you know, second best to the kingdom of Judah. You will have whatever you require. And moreover, God says in verse 38, I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David. So imagine. God is in no way ill-treating Jeroboam, you know, even before the man is even a king. While he is still just the head of a labor force, God is making these promises to him. And Jeroboam very sadly forgets these promises or rather does not believe them, doesn't trust the Lord. Uh, so anyway, um, when Solomon gets to know that this prophecy has been given to Jeroboam, he tries to kill him. You know, Solomon has now finally come to a stage where he's lost completely lost it I mean this man has been newly anointed you know to be a king and here is Solomon you know behaving just like Saul and he tries to actually kill Jeroboam Jeroboam runs from there and he takes shelter in Egypt so we see Solomon falling very very badly and the very sad thing is we see Jeroboam also falling in the same way so the question we, I know even as we're sitting over here we need to ask ourselves is what is wrong with all these people why why did they all fall they all received amazing promises God was in no way withholding anything from them but why why were they all falling one after the other um, so you know just very quickly coming to Rehoboam who was supposed to be the successor of Solomon so like we already said the people come to Rehoboam and they say, you know, will you show us kindness? Your father completely forgot that he's supposed to be a shepherd king, completely forgot that he's supposed to look after us, but he exploited us, took advantage of us. But now at least will you lighten the load? And Rehoboam, of course, he takes the advice of his friends who tell him that he should be a very strong and uh, what very aristocratic monarch. And uh, so he, you know, he says, no, I will increase your burdens. And because of that, uh, the people choose uh, that they do not want Rehoboam to be in charge of them any longer. Yes. It's a valid reason. Um, the, one of the students, uh, uh, they say that maybe the kings were falling and not holding on to higher standards because of the example set by the previous king. Where the previous king fell and he was not up to the mark, that wrong example would be picked up by his successor. And so the standard was falling. And that's very true because David sometimes did not present, give an honorable example. He did not set an honorable example. Um, also, we see in the case of 
Solomon and in the case of Rehoboam that there was insecurity. God had made promises, but will God fulfill? Is God strong enough to fulfill? Can he hold me on the throne and keep me in my position? No, I need to do something from my side to strengthen my position because God is, wants me to focus on other things. He wants me to look after the people, spend all my time attending to them, to their needs. And if I keep serving, 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 what will happen to my position? Because, you know, this is a competitive world. I need to hold on to my power. If I'm be being a servant always and serving and all of that, what's going to happen to my position? Someone needs to look after that because God doesn't seem to be very concerned about that. So Solomon goes down that same line, you know, one political alliance after another, trying to build himself up, trying to make himself stronger. And Rehoboam, in the same way, he takes the advice of his friends and he says, no, no, if I'm soft, then they'll, you know, they'll take me lightly. On the other hand, if I'm strong and hard and tough, you know, then they will respect me. And Jeroboam goes in the same direction because he says to himself, after you know, he, he has got the 10, 10 tribes and now only uh, two tribes are left to the house of David, he says to himself, this is what he says to himself in, um, we, we are still in chapter 12. Okay, fine. Uh, First Kings chapter 12, verse 27, if someone could read out. Okay, maybe 20, oh, yeah, uh, just a minute. 26 and 27. Yeah, First Kings uh, 12, 26 and 27. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just, yeah, 26 and 27 should be fine. So again, we see Jeroboam is telling himself, all these people from my 10 tribes, every year they're going to go up to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices over there. They're going to have this sentimental tie towards Jerusalem. They're going to be reminded of their ancestors and their ancestral history and all of the things that Yahweh has done. And they will want to go and be, again be part of Jerusalem. They will abandon me. In fact, maybe they, they may kill me. And he starts thinking about all of this. But what is the promise that God made to him? He said, everything that you desire, you will be able to rule. And God says, I will make you a dynasty which is as enduring as that of David. And those promises are all just forgotten because Jeroboam is so insecure. He is so afraid and he wants to hold on to his throne. And so he takes one step forward, which is even worse than the step which has been taken by the others. You know, he thinks, no, no, I need to come up with some other gods so that these people will stay over here itself and not go to Jerusalem. And so he takes the advice of some counselors and he makes two golden calves and he sets up one at, where are the two calves set up? Just to see if my students are awake. Where are, that would be maybe versus around there only 26 27 he makes two golden calves and where, do, where does he set up the golden calves perfect yes in bethel and dan and it says in the next paragraph that he also you know appoints a festival which is similar to the festival which they will have in jerusalem so he tells the people you don't have to go over there and celebrate the festival you have a similar festival over here itself so you can offer sacrifices to the golden calf over here and participate in the you know in the festival so Jerob and this is called throughout you know the kings and chronicles this is referred to as the sin of Jeroboam because of him because of his sin uh, the people are led into massive idolatry okay so um, we see Solomon and Rehoboam and Jeroboam suffering from deep insecurity now compared to them you and I are just very ordinary people. We have no thrones. Uh, you know, uh, we don't have any royal coronation ceremony, nothing like that. And so it is much easier for us to become insecure in the ministry that the Lord gives to us, in the tasks which he assigns to us. And that's a very foolish and dangerous move. You know, so just be secure in your Lord. The plans and purposes he has for your life, they will be fulfilled. 
the plans and purposes that he has for someone else he will fulfill in their life don't try to be them don't aspire for what they have because in your eyes what you have may be small because you know we have defective eyesight defective perspective we look at the task given to us and we think it is small but in the eyes of the lord there is no small task let me tell you for him whether you have the gifting of hospitality or whether you have the gifting of you know uh, of being an apostle for him it is equally important and in fact we see that in the new testament where the people engaged in hospitality were as anointed by the holy spirit as the ones who were doing the apostolic work so just because you have a very limited uh, you know perspective about yourself and the task given to you don't limit god in his eyes every task is important so do not be insecure hold on to him be uh, loyal in your serving because it's uh, leadership is all about serving and even as you're doing that he will take care of your name and your position that he will take care of whatever he needs to do to you know so that you can continue having that name and be able to accomplish the things that you're meant to accomplish through your ministry he'll take care of he'll deal with those things so you just be secure that is the difference between david and these other kings david he was nothing he was running around in the wilderness for his life he gets two chances to do away with saul he says no no god can take care of my position god can take care of my power i just need to have the right attitude and do what is honorable in his sight so that is the contrast that we see between david and these kings so i'm sorry that we took up so much time on these things but i really wanted us to grasp this one basic truth because we see we're going to see a lot of this happening even in second kings and in chronicles where these kings what is motivating them what is driving them what is causing them to be behave in a particular way you know so this is one very key key factor all right so um this was one important lesson that i wanted us to pick up from the lives of these main you know leaders uh in the in the very beginning of this monarchical stage all right if anyone has any questions we could get to that um yes Hmm. Hmm. I do not know where exactly it is mentioned. Uh, the student is asking about the king who uh, had held the Passover feast after a long gap, and who also, you know, uh, broke down all the idols. uh he's probably referring to josiah or hezekiah i'm not particularly sure uh, sure whom he's referring to and um he's asking for the scripture reference i don't know i don't know which uh, but but yeah okay uh, so yeah we'll we'll get to all of that uh to whatever we can get to uh, but we'll try to look at the main main key points we you know which are, which are there in each of these books because these are history books and history can take months actually to cover and we don't have months okay uh yeah um any other questions otherwise we'll actually close with a word of prayer okay all are at peace but they're all awake yes okay let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for the very very valuable life lessons oh lord that are contained in your historical books you didn't put this uh, records together just to impart knowledge you paid place them over here oh lord for correction for uh, inspiration for uh, uh, for learning and so oh lord i pray that we would never ever read the historical books just as a historical account but we would try to see what we can gain uh, from a spiritual perspective from these stories oh lord So oh Lord I pray that we would be secure in you we would be confident in you we would stay focused on doing the task that you have given us and Lord we would not focus on position and power and status oh Lord because those things come from the throne of the Lord in your time in your way you will grant us whatever is needed for us to fulfill our work and fulfill our ministry so oh Lord we don't need to run after those and lord if we are still hungry for those things when the kingdom comes so oh lord when your new heavens and earth come in that time oh lord we will have all the glory and position we would possibly need so lord we don't need to run after those things now 
now oh lord is the phase of life where we are meant to focus on you and serve you and be your hands and feet and fulfill your purposes help us a oh lot to do that help us a oh lot to do it in such a way that you can declare and say that we have been faithful servants who had your own heart oh lord help us to be that kind of leaders and servants thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much online students and thank you i know all of you who are here uh, we'll close the recording and we'll meet again next week